Okay, so good evening, everyone, and thanks for joining us for tonight's webinar, uh, which is titled How Might We Use Game Insights to Develop Realistic Practices for Our Players? First thing to say is a massive thank you for joining us. This is a topic that myself and the rest of the panel are really excited about talking uh, about and unpacking. What experience have you got of using insights and taking it um, into your coaching practice on the grass? Yeah, I think first and foremost, valued one at our players, players themselves. I think they're a really valued insight, asking them um, how they feel, what the decisions are, what's going on. So I'll give you a specific example. Um, you know, you could be asking the centre forwards come to you and, and they're just literally telling you, I'm, I just can't score goals in matches, but I'm doing really, really well in, in training. That'll just start a trigger a process on, you know, what's my design like? I'm, is it realistic to the game? Am I trying to put some things together? Um, but really kind of getting a viewpoint from, from the players because fundamentally they have a different one from us. So in terms of, of that, it gives us another type of insight that might either, one, reassure some things that we might already know about or secondly, challenge some of the thoughts that might be going up against us as well. Really interesting. Thanks, Claire. Nevs, what you got for us? Uh, gets me thinking back to the days when I coached and <laughs> didn't coach people. I think coach adults rather. Um, I think when I when I cast my mind back, we'd use insights. For example, you give the players pitch side tasks to look at, performance problems the teams are giving you, and get them to feedback. And that could be related to ILPs. It could be related to theme of the week, or it could be just related to a problem that the players are seeing. And we might get their opinion on how they might solve it on the match day, and they might lead the, the, the team talk, or they might lead the, the off field coaching session. Again, similarly. Um, we'd have performance education on Saturday where the, where the kids would watch themselves. And it's a hugely important thing to do is to get the kids to watch themselves and learn from how they might, as Claire said, might not be executing a technique right, they might not be running into space or spotting the space right. There's all sorts of ways you can get, you can use insights to inform your practice. But I think ultimately it's what you value in terms of how you play or um, what you want the kids to be, the, the players to be exposed to that informs your practice. One term we use within FA education when we're talking about game insights and we're teaching about performance analysis and objective data, take this idea of pitch to practice. So the game actually informing what we do within our coaching sessions, we call it pitch to practice. There's a few different ideas there, which I'll just talk us through. First question we've got to ask when we're kind of... Um, collecting some objective insights what do the players need in order to develop you know that's a real fundamental question that we should always start with and then the next question is how can i actually gain some objectivity in this area that removes us from just thoughts and feelings just opinions just trust in our eye um obviously something we always need to rely on our coach observation but how can we add to it so those are the first two points there and then it's about collecting some data some insight data might be conversation and you're collecting those um those conversations, you're scribbling them down, but data might be numbers as well. And we're comfortable at different different levels with, with within our experiences. Then it's about interpreting those insights and, and being further curious to go back to video, go back and check things with players, go back and watch coaching sessions or matches with a different lens on, depending on what our insights are telling us. So I guess we'll leave this slide with this, with this idea of the game is common, co commonly presenting players with these opportunities or problems this is what it's throwing up this is the this is what it's posing off the players how can we try and replicate our practices to look as similar to the game as possible we've got a little video for you in a second it's uh, it includes both boys and girls under 11s and under 14s within the talent development space so we're just about to press play but before we do that write down when you're watching the video Write down in the chat any observations that you have about the goals that are going in. Now, it's not purposely been put together with a certain type of goal, but just any observations you might have. And this is going to be on your lens as a coach and what your experience is. Um, but just, just be interested to see what you're seeing when we press play now.
six capabilities are in essence is a way to, for an individual, their individual tactics or, or thinking tool or events to look through, but they're a way for individuals to gain advantage over opponent. That could be before, during or after the ball has been, and it could be defensive or offensive. So in possession or out of possession. Um, think of them, when you're looking at your session designs in particular, if we're drilling down to certain aspects of of the moment of the game, you can think of these almost like a drop down menu. Each one will rise to the top at some point, but if you cast your lens on one particular one, you might be able to help the player um, either develop something further or um, it might be an aspect they're very strong at, which we can make even better. But there are ways, the six capabilities are really a way of gaining an individual advantage over your opponent. It's a nice way to think about it. Throughout this case study, We've taken the finish locations for goals and then we've looked at the, 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 three, the three factors on the right-hand side, goal zones, finish technique and external influences through the lens of a certain location. So we've said from the data, what are the key locations where goals are being scored in the Men's World Cup? Okay, show us the data where the goals are going in, how they're being scored and the external influences just from goals within that key zone. So we've reduced some of the noise and we've, we've tidied it up a bit all games have got to have a good name. This one's called It's a Knockout. If you give our, give our games a good name and the games enable the players to practice a certain set of skills, then the players can then, every time you mention that, the players can download that opportunity, download the required skills to win this game. It becomes a great way of learning and uh, establishing some learning principles. Simple game, keeper starts. Players try to work an opportunity. The aim is to score either more goals in the opposition or you can eliminate the players. And you do that by the following. If you score a one-touch finish, the player that scores can eliminate two players from the practice to behind the gates. Two-touch finish, one player, three or more, you still get your goal, but you don't get to eliminate any players. So we still got loads of goals, but you get that chance to really try to score one touch or try to score two touch. And we'll talk a little bit more why that might be developmentally appropriate um, as we go, because one-touch finishes might just not be in the locker for uh, under nine, under five, under six, and seven, ten, um, just in terms of how they see the game. So players who score, they've got five seconds to eliminate the player. Once that player's out, they have to stand behind the gates. Now, throughout the game, we're trying to reward creativity. So we're thinking about, uh, and positive play, so thinking about, if we shoot and we score, our keeper restarts, so we get to go again. If we shoot and they save and it goes out, we get to go again. If we shoot and miss, the opposition starts. So you might have a moment where you can create an unbalance and be on the back foot as a keeper. If he's thinking fast, can go and play. Really good fun. One thing it does do, it creates overloads and underloads. Critically important for scoring, critically important to establish and understand how, how you move space and how you appreciate space. One thing this game does, so if you look at the player red at the minute who's on the ball, he's enticing or potentially enticing the blue player towards him or her, apologies. And you can do one of two things, shift and score and hopefully eliminate one player or lend to his mate because he's enticed to create the space behind him, make a run behind his mate or their mate, plays the ball to them, and they can score first time into the into the goal and eliminate two players. So you're giving the you're creating repetition without repetition, creative repetition. You're creating a moment in the game and getting to replicate what we've just seen in the, in the data. And the kids or players have a chance to have some fun. This slide just demonstrates that if if you are a player or a couple of players down, you can buy that player back in by finding them with a pass. Now the gates are just outside the playing surface. Now you could do. As, as big as you want this, you could have it a, a metre away, you could have it a couple of feet away, a couple of centimetres away, however you want. But the player must take a positive touch back into the game. And if you think of where the arrow is placed, that's like a player. In taking a touch into the second six-yard box, they could either score or choose to cooperate with a mate or recycle. You could have all sorts of all sorts of fun. It is about what do we see in front of us. And many of them, uh, they don't like to share. I mean, certainly we know when we've got the younger kids up to a point of up to 11, it's about me, my and I. Um, you know, we are looking at, you know, the simplicities and also just common sense of motor skill learning, development, games formats we need to consider as well. 
you know, we, we get into 11 v 11 aside as that moves in. So that is the shift. But we've got to remember we said that what data is and what it isn't as well. So it's it's just giving you some reassurances to say, well, do you know what? Yes, my under nines is going to be like this and they're going to be very savvy. However, they are role modelling the senior team. They are looking up to their role models and whether it's just from the World Cup that's just gone from the women's and the men's and what we've just done from those insights, they want to aspire to be them. So when we ask the question why, sometimes the why not. So it's a really important from our environment is to create um, a, a comfortable and a creative way for them to keep trying. And I think the language you go back to again about that coach language, to allowing them to keep trying, to allow them to get provide. And again, we've got mentioned there about confidence, supportiveness, you know, peer support, as well as coach support within ourselves. Just the smile, just the nod. I'm not saying just because they're just body language is such as is important. Um, but from our bit, you know, if I go along and do some coach development, that word unlucky is banned, you know, because it really is delving into love the idea of how what you want to do. But actually, can you explain or do we give them some intent on there? Claire mentioned formats and, and and developmental stages. And you think about what under nines play. Hopefully they play three, five aside, not seven and nine. But hopefully you think about the smaller formats and what they look like when they play. There's not many passes necessarily. We think about the, the, the psychological makeup of a child, egocentric, they're the centre of their world, not decentered yet. But they have empathy, so they can share. So they can pass, but also let's think proprioceptively and developmentally. They might just not be ready to deal with a ball coming out and to hit it first time. That's a really hard skill in terms of judging distance. The frontal lobes of a nine, ten-year-old aren't developed yet in terms of hierarchical thinking, organisational thinking. So there's loads of things here. That w- and this is why I mentioned in the game. You can ask them to try to do a first-time finish, but to demand it of a nine-year-old, you must finish first time. That, that's a really difficult concept for some nine-year-olds and younger and 10-year-old, 11-year-olds to grasp. But we can certainly use the words try and notice that. And you think about why that might be for the teenagers. Peers become more important developmentally. Sharing becomes more important. And then as you get towards PDP and senior players, well, it's performance. So I best finish first time because I don't have a lot of time. So I've, I've got to finish first time. Then we've got the habits and the skills and the positioning and the timing to then really attack it. So I think it's contextual, it's developmental, it's aging stage. And I think this thinking about the game, the 11 v 11 game and their game and thinking about what players you look after, who's in your care, what formats do you play and where they might be in their stage of development. How many goals were assisted? How many goals were given to us by team? We're starting to layer this data in and we can have some of the same conversations we were just having about sharing the ball, about um, passing to teammates. Are we, you know, technically tactically, physically able to execute um, passes to our teammates. What's the level of defending like? What's the level of uh, goalkeeping pressure, all the rest of it? score you're happy you've got a goal for your team i think it was a corner and i was taking it and i passed it to one of my teammates and then i ran around the back of her and asked for it again so i was on like the edge of the box and i just heard my dad sh- like say shoot so i just did and it went in top line you know at this level at foundation level there's no way we could possibly know what position uh, players are going to play so we will try very much not to pigeonhole them, so everyone's got to have those techniques of how to finish because we don't know what the game's going to look like in, in five, ten years. So giving everyone the tools to do the job is, is a massive part for us. To be in a good position to shoot, you've got to read the game quite well. A uh, bit of instinct in there, you know, something that you might have a little knack for or you can work on just to get into the right position to score more goals. I think communication probably because you've, you've got to know what's around you because you obviously don't have eyes in the back of your head so you can't see everywhere and communication really helps. Can I try because it's left side and I I think my side is quite lucky with my left side so then I scored because I know that a few days I have been training for my free kicks and 
dribbling stuff, so I just want to use it on the pitch and show that I can do it and be confident. One thing that we've picked up on over the last couple of years is that we're actually very good at creating chances, but we don't score as many as what we should do. Um, and ultimately, if you don't practice that, you're not going to get better at it. So, yeah, we've, we, um, whether that's opposed, whether that's unopposed, it doesn't really matter, but just giving the players that exposure within a session of what it actually feels like to score um, and be in and around the box and in and around the goal, but also just to give our goalkeepers exposure of what that feels like as well. I want some importance about bringing players part of the process within the game itself, so in action of the game. Um, so we literally start off with a question. So, you know, rather than judgment and actually, you know, are we thinking on the same lines? Are we reassuring? So if it's things about like, what were you thinking at that moment when this happened? What were you thinking when you were doing that? What were your thoughts about this? Because again, I mentioned originally, they've got a different viewpoint because we watch... I think I've heard it in a way of a horizontal way. They watch it in a vertical way. You've got to kind of put it that in that respect. Um, so we might see something different, what they did. So unless we know, then how can we form a, a really kind of uh, eclipse judgment on that? And also fundamentally, we're about educating them. So the how, the when, the why, the what are they doing, really simplicity of it is start with the why. Why did you do that? We had 75% possession, I think and said we just couldn't score. And it resonated from my time when I was in, in club that we had all these players that could keep the ball and possess, but we couldn't put the ball in the back of the net. And when we looked and we started to look at our insights into our environment, there wasn't enough finishing practice. There wasn't enough goals in practice. We didn't have any principles about how we might finish. We didn't think about how we finished. We didn't think about changing the pitch to elicit different finishes. So. If you want to get a diagonal and a straight, you might stretch the pitch out in terms of training. The same game that I did, perhaps, but you might stretch it, make it long, so the diagonal and the straight happen. You get that space to invade behind. You might encourage different core moves. So I think it is about looking at your own environment and your own insight. Why didn't we score? What was it that we couldn't do? What did the player? What are the players? How can we help the players see the pictures in terms of their relationship with time and space in front of them, and also. Do we perhaps need to unlock some core moves for them that might help them create those moments to, to get the 43% where there's no defender or a 57% where there's one and shot packing? Do we teach them to shift and score, shift the ball and shoot through legs? Yeah, there's, there's loads of nuances here, but it really is thinking about what's your age group, what's the challenge in front of you, what level are the players? And then thinking, how do I add value to them and increase, in this case, finishing? Claire, you first. What, what's, what's it got you curious about uh, being a part of tonight and what are you going to take into your coaching moving forward? I think um, snappy lines on how players can remember things. So I think I'm going to try to make sure that they give, they've got the kind of buzzwords and the hooks and they can be motivated on to kind of get them um, excited about the games that they play. Nice. Now, so what's it got you more curious about or what's it got you thinking about this evening? It got me thinking about how we task players who... Uh, 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 let's not have subs. Let's let's try not to have substitutes. Let's try to think about formats. And but if we've got players substituted, how do we task them with getting them interested about the game? How do we get? How do we task them about looking at the position they're about to go on to? What can we see? What can we task them? What insights can we get them to, to start to understand and unpick in the game? How can we improve their love and understanding and curiosity of the game? Brilliant. Thank you so much. So the um, last thing to do is thank both yourself, Claire, and yourself, Nervous, for being part of, of the panel and adding in your expertise and experience.